yeah, so um, my name's Dan Lee, um, and I'm going to be talking mainly about this project that we, we ran 2015-17 to 17 in Kirkwall as part of the THI uh, Townscape Heritage Initiative. And I'm also going to pass over in the middle for a bit of a section uh, to Scott. Um, but we're going to sort of run through the project and put it in a bit of a wider context. Um, and talk about, talk about the exciting archaeology that we did, with, probably with quite a few of you in the room here, hopefully. So um, hopefully it'll be a nice, a nice way of sharing some of those results with you. And the report's nearly there, so we'll be able to share that as well as soon as, um, uh, uh, as we can. Um, so urban archaeology in Orkney might, might, might not seem like the most obvious thing. We're all used to people excavating in brocks and uh, the Nessa Brogga. I mean, I suppose we could argue that the Nessa Brogga is potentially a sort of Neolithic urban site. It's so densely populated so densely uh, uh, populated with those structures. But certainly that's where the attention is lie, lay, you know, with, with a lot of archaeological research in Orkney over the, the last few decades. It's been with the, the Iron Age, with the kind of prehistoric sites, um, more firmly rooted in the countryside. So what about urban archaeology in Orkney? Well, of course, we know the wealth and the history of Kirkwood, and we'll touch on some of that tonight. Um, but it's certainly, the THI programme has certainly provided a very useful opportunity to reignite, because we'll, we'll, we'll br briefly touch upon some of the earlier excavations in, in Kirkwall, um, reignite some of the interest in, in urban archaeology. And of course, Kirkwall having the long history that it does offers us lots of opportunities to discover this. So we're going to take you through this, the project that we did, which, you know, there's quite a lot of different aspects to it, and I'm going to focus on the archaeological aspects on that, rather than an overarching history of Kirkwall. We'll run through that um, fairly shortly. Um, so Kirkwall, a town of change, you know, it's another thing we maybe think about. We look across the landscape and sort of, you know, we think about things as being timeless, and we can see some rapid changes in Kirkwall even over the last few months. And we'll, we'll I'll feedback one of the recent projects that we were part of as a slight tangent to this um, towards the end of the talk because there's been recent discovery or rediscovery of the Kirkwall Castle on Castle Street just as a way of showing, because that's also linking into the THI project. And there's some other recent projects that I'm going to touch upon today that kind of give a little bit further steps to some of the work that we're doing. But a town of change, I mean, you know, before, one of the main aims, I think, with the Kirkwall THI archaeology programme, and certainly with the project, yes, it's doing up historic buildings and restore, you know, it's done a fantastic job, as it did in, in, in Stromness. Um, it's also had these other, other kind of aspects that uh, it's, 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 there's, there's less kind of tangible um, traces of the town's history, you know, throughout the townscape. So we're looking down um, Junction Road here, um, and you know, for for those of you who haven't studied the maps, for those of you who haven't necessarily got that knowledge of Kirkwall, who would have known that this was the actual, actually the seafront? Only as recently as 1865, when Junction Road was built, the ends of the piers stopped on the right. This road is actually built across the ends of all these piers, and we'll look at some of the maps in a moment. To the left was the sea. But there's not really many traces of that in the landscape, in the townscape, and that's certainly one thing that the project's going to do is it's going to bring together some of these um, historical narratives, looking at the different um, development of the town, and trying to make that a bit more um, obvious during the town as you walk around. So some of those things you'll start to see, I think, appear um, as, they're, as, they're, as they're completed fairly soon. Um, so there's, just, just to bring that home, that's you know, what we're talking about again. So in the, probably in the 1930s, this, this archive photograph here with a Great Western Road there, with a gap where the power station is, a gap where the Super Bowl used to be and now these museum stores is, and where Tesco's and uh, uh, Lidl's is just green fields. So you can see even in the recent past, Kirkwall's been through some quite dramatic changes. Um, so for a town that has this really quite incredible historic core, the town has changed an incredible amount, even in the 20th century. So the Kirkwall THI Archaeology Programme was a three-year, well, two-year project, it ended up being three years, um, project that was um, sort of run in tandem with all the kind of building heritage and restoration work in the conservation area. And um, it was run as an opportunity to provide um, engagement for schools, it was run as an opportunity to, to find out some new information about Kirkwall, to do some excavations and do a whole range of different activities in the town. And 
in the processes of developing the project, we, we have three research questions, three key questions, and we'll revisit these as we go through. But just some really simple questions. How does the town develop through the medieval, post-medieval, modern periods? We know the history behind that, but what can archaeology contribute to that? You know, there's, there's some amazing volumes. There's Hossack's collection of the historical evidence, and um, we don't quite know where he got all the information from, because it's not referenced in this huge volume around 1900 which gives you this incredibly thick description of all the different streets and properties in the town. But these are from historical sources. So what can we say archaeologically through looking at the traces, the more kind of everyday traces in the town, the things that people threw away, the little stories that lie in those deposits and those structures that are not really captured in any of the sort of documentary evidence. What can we say about those? So what is the kind of... And we were trying to select some areas, some buildings and some sites within the conservation area to try and... Um, to try and answer some of these questions. And one of the main parts of the project was trying to um, get the people of Kirkwall involved in, in, in excavating and surveying in the town to try and revitalise this interest and this engagement with the built heritage and finding out what lies beneath, beneath our feet. So it was really about trying to engage, and I'll be just talking just about that and then about the more recent past, which is quite underlooked and understudied in Orkney because of everyone sort of uh, blinded by the Iron Age or um, you know, um, busy with the Neolithic. So what about the more recent past? What can we say about the, the, sort of the last few hundred years of, of the history of Kirkwall? So um, the project had uh, four kind of main uh, sort of themes or sort of areas of activity. So we undertook building recording. So that's looking at the built heritage, looking at the standing buildings. Um, and there is an archaeological approach to building recording because archaeology is about unpicking, unpicking structures, unpicking narratives and recording the physical remains, recording the physical materials um, and adding those to the national uh, record in Scotland. So we undertook some bu building recording in the town on a few sites which we'll have a look at briefly. We undertook geophysical survey and it's the first time that sort of more extensive geophysical survey has been undertaken in the town in some of the people's gardens in this room. Um, so we undertook a range of techniques, and we'll have a quick look at those and the results from those. Um, we undertook excavation, and we did kind of two phases of excavation. So we did um, an initial phase, which was a trench in RBS Gardens, uh, the, uh, the bank in the garden, uh, uh, just on uh, Tankless Lane. Um, and that was, this was back in 2016, so that was in May, and it coincided with the Jutland uh, commemorations. So I was trying to persuade um, um, people in the in all the Ice Council, colleagues in the council, that it would be a really good idea to dig a big hole in the middle of the museum gardens, right when all the kind of uh, the uh, uh, you know the, the important people from across the world were coming to see Kirkwall. So weren't too happy with that. But luckily, RBS Bank were, were were quite cooperative, and we were allowed to excavate in their gardens. So a lot of the project was you know we weren't we weren't kind of digging up roads, we weren't digging up inaccessible places. We were kind of very much. Um, at the mercy of the kindness of local residents and interest that they had to, to, to let us dig in their gardens um, and look, look, in, look in sort of little nooks and crannies around the town. So we kind of like slotted in around everything rather than, rather than causing uh, any sort of major um, disruption. We also undertook paleo environmental analysis um, and again, um, oh sorry, and then the excavation, I forgot to mention that we had the garden dig as well. So that followed on later in that year. And that was very much about doing small trenches in people's gardens. So we tried to have a sequence of, so the geophysical survey would then inform the excavations, um, which was then informed further by paleo environmental analysis. So trying to link these different aspects together across the town. And then we undertook some paleo environmental analysis. Um, we did a bit of calling in the PDC, um, and we undertook, we took a big column sample, which is what Scott's going to talk about um, in the trench in the RBS Bank garden. Uh, which has its own interesting story, and Scott will tell us a little bit about that in a moment. But throughout this, all these activities, one of the main points about it was to, to, to provide opportunities for volunteers and members of the public to get involved, to learn new skills. We had students from uh, um, the UHI, students from our college, um, uh, Orkney College, doing archaeology and various other subjects as well that got involved. We had school children as well involved, hundreds and hundreds of school children were involved in various uh, aspects of the, the project, specific, mostly at um, the RBS bank excavations, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so all in all, it was quite a kind of very wide-ranging project, and you had these quite mixed teams of 
all different people from all walks of life working together. It was a really, really enjoyable experience. So hopefully some of that enthusiasm will come across today. So Kirkwall, there it is. I don't necessarily need to tell most of you in this room where it is. Uh, there might be some people here that maybe it's their first time. So we'll, we'll start with the basics and I'm not going to assume um, masses of uh, previous knowledge just in case that's the case. But there we are, there's Kirkwall with the big bay to the, to the north, Scapa to the south. Um, always favoured, but it's linked to the sea to the north and probably to the south uh, through the beach there. A town of course grown around that bay. Um, and what we'll do now is we'll just take a, we'll take a quick stroll through some of the map evidence we have. Um, some maps are kind of uh, a bit more schematic and then we'll move on to some of the historical maps, just to try and put some of this in a bit, a bit of context. Um, the main core area of the project that we were interested in was this blue, just to introduce that now, is this blue line here, which is the conservation area. So that's the really historic core of the town. It was actually expanded out in 2014 to encompass more of the area on the east there. But generally, it's that kind of core part of the town that we're interested in. But we'll, we'll just take a, a walk through the maps and just uh, look at how the town's developed briefly over, over the last uh, 2,000 years. So, sort of the prehistory of Kirkwall. Um, well, luckily for Martin, there's a brock. Uh, he hasn't been talking about brocks tonight, is he? No? Okay, we'll get, we'll get one in there. But, sort of, you know, pre. Pre the historic period into the Iron Age, um, because of the nature of the town being in existence and us not maybe doing uh, lots of excavation as we might have been doing in other places in Orkney, um, we don't know very much about the pre prehistory of Kirk. Well, there's been a few trace finds, there's been a random Roman coin, there's been a few things found around the town. But underneath the uh, junction at the end of Broad Street, by what was Spencer's News Agents, which is now just changing, opposite the RBS bank is a slow, a low hump <coughs> in the road. You see the uppies kind of walking down it as they come down at the bar. Well, that, that hump in the road is, is the remains of an Iron Age brock. Um, and we've got a photo, that was, some of it was found in, in, in 1986 when there was some roadworks done. Chris has found some other traces of it doing a watching brief um, in the Tankers House Gardens. But we don't know much about this brock, but um, we certainly think that's one of the sort of earliest forms of settlement actually within the town. You can see there, at this time, right on the edge of a long inlet, um, which is a very shallow kind of coastal inlet with an air, you can see stretching out across there, um, and, uh, and a gap at the top. So this is all tidal at that time. Um, and then the earliest kind of references really comes from the, the sagas, and then we end up with um, uh, the Earl's Palace, kind of in that northern part of the town there, with Ronald Brewerson's Hall. It's mentioned in the sagas. I'm not going to go into lots of detail about this now. There's mention of a drinking hall. We don't know how substantial the settlement was at that time, but you know it's likely that there was fairly substantial um, buildings, probably a hall, and they were located up in that northern part of the town. But if you know the town at all and now, then you'll know that most of that area is probably underneath where the fuel tanks are, the fuel depot, or the housing or um, the anchor buildings up there. So again, very or zero archaeological work is being done in that area. And if you think about those tanks, and think one of the arguments for removing them is that they leak a lot, imagine what that's done to the probably very deeply stratified, very beautifully rich archaeological deposits below. But that's maybe a headache for the future. Um, but also an opportunity, of course. Um, so that's the earliest part of the town there, the Earl's residence in the, in the kind of uh, early 11th century. Um, and then, of course, the cathedral in the 12th century, uh, built to house the remains of Magnus, when the political power used to be in Bercy at the time with, the, um, with, uh, with Thorfinn, out with the Earl's residence with Bercy. And it was through the kind of warring brothers, um, Ronald moved to Kirkwall, created the uh, built the cathedral to house, under the persuasion of his uncle, built the cathedral to house Magnus's relics. And that's and the movement of the saints' relics was the, when the sort of power shifted over to Kirkwall. So quite a significant point in Kirkwall's history, and from then on it became a kind of commercial centre in Orkney, and it flourished as a, as a, as a trading town. So moving through uh, sort of medieval to the post-medieval period, you have the two, two real parts of the town. So you have the borough, the Earl's residence in the north, and then you have the cathedral complex in Laverock, which is the sort of bishop's residence in the south. 
And as the town grew, still very much situated along the edge of the, the, the shoreline there, as the town grew, um, those, two, those two areas basically joined up. Um, so, and in the middle, of course, uh, built in the late 14th century, was Kirkwall Castle, said to be one of the strongest strong, strongholds in the north. Of course, built at a time when Orkney was still under Scandinavian rule. Um, but the castle was besieged in 1614 by um, uh, Scots, and it was dismantled, mostly dismantled in 1615. Um, and then, of course, 18, 1865 was when, as we'll see in some of the later maps, you get quite considerable changes in the town with the construction of Junction Road and other, other changes. The, the castle was finally demolished. But we, we, it's recently been, uh, part of it's recently been unearthed, and we'll look at that a bit later. So by then, by the kind of, um, sort of mid medieval period, later medieval period, early post medieval period, but a flourishing town along the edge of the shore. So we're leaping on now to one of the first more detailed maps. So here you can see the cathedral in the middle, the main street running down there. You can see the town's very much still following that line at the edge of the edge of the, uh, the sea. Um, you can see the air is still is still um, disconnected at the top. Um, you can see a harbour that's developed at the top um, in in in, uh, in Kirkwood Bay. Um, but you can see how the, the the sort of street line has, has moved out into the into the sea. And as you'd expect, a flourishing merchant town, the town was gradually encroaching into the and, and growing into the sea. And that's a pattern we'll see as we look through the maps, as you'll see the, 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 the PDC becomes much smaller and then eventually becomes what it is today. Um, this is just the southern part of that, if you like, the boot of, of the sea down there with the curve at the bottom there. So really, we just leapt a little bit back in time, but this is a much more detailed map and this is one that's really relevant to us in looking at what we're doing along this southern part of the town. This was some dispute between two neighbours in the, in, the, in the middle of the map there, on, uh, between a close, between two properties. What that dispute resulted in for us was this incredibly detailed map that shows each property along the, the shore there. This is the museum garden <laughs> up here, but you can see the shores right along here. But interestingly, we'll come back to these, you can see some of these little almost like little uh, walkways across. This is a very, very shallow um, uh, area of the sea indeed, so it have only been filled at, at, at high tide. And then by the late 19th century, the first really detailed mapping by the Ordnance Survey, um, we can see the construction of Junction Road. So you can see there's the, there's the line of the town running through there, and you can see Junction Road has basically just been built as a bypass, pretty much to the town. Along the edge of the old piers and the Burgess plots they've been extended out from the street frontage into the into the into the PEC or PEC it's marked there. Um, so quite a quite a big shift change for the town, painting about the narrowness of the street, the busyness of the street. And this is the time as well when Castle Street was 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 the, the castle was demolished and opposite where um, the real is today um, that, that road was put in to create kind of like link through to it so that people could cut through and didn't have to go all the way down the main street. So quite a fundamental change for the town. You can still see outside the library um, as well, there's a little plaque and there's a remnant of part of that sea wall to go for it. Um, and then there's the sort of modern townscape today. So you can see the main street running through here, Junction Road, and then we saw that aerial photograph. It's sort of the more industrial kind of part of the town, the power station, the fire station, the police station, was gradually um, moved out into the town by dumping a whole load of material. But that's basically been kind of an ongoing story, it's about dumping material to create more land in the town, and that's been going on since pretty much the cathedral was built. So this is some of the sort of traces that we were interested in finding during our project. Um, so, it's a bit about the history of the town. So you can see a lot of the town under, on, on that sort of western part is made on made up ground. It's made on um, ground that's been kind of built up over the years, sometimes quite gradually, often quite rapidly. But of course that can contain a lot of cultural material. And these are the sort of things, it's a major part of the story of the town, yet a lot of the kind of investigations have focused on the big buildings, the, the famous buildings, the Bishop's Palace, the, the cathedral, etc. So these sorts of projects are the opportunity to look at those more kind of everyday traces in the townscape. And you might write all that material off thinking, oh, it's just, it's just made ground, but within that there's an incredible story. Um, and some of that was, uh, was unearthed during excavations in 1978 by Neil McGavin. 
and he actually, this is actually, if you could call it sort of research excavation, this was really the last research excavations in Kirkwall, where archaeologists put trenches in specific places to try and find out answers about the development of the town. And that, the next research excavations was our project. So that kind of shows you there's almost a 40 year gap in sort of research led excavations. Although there have been some sort of developer uh, led excavations where archaeologists have monitored um, works that have gone in the town. And we'll look, at, we'll look at those very briefly in a moment. So here you can see the dots where they investigated. So very much following that street. And it's similar to what we were kind of trying to enhance the story that <coughs> Gavin had uh, so successfully uncovered. Um, he found the, remains, <coughs> found the remains of the beach right up close to the, to the street. He found the remains of banks running kind of north-south along that way. He found the remains of stone sea walls as well, running up behind Albert Street then, near number two. Um, and he found more of those to, sort of further down to the south in Guns Close, number five down there. Um, and amazingly, underneath, uh, they, they did an excavation underneath the floor in one of the rooms in Tankless House, which is a museum today. And under there, they found lots of bits of worked red sandstone. And they interpreted that as part of the actual kind of mason's yard for the construction of the cathedral. So these are the sorts of things that have been found, you know, um, in, in the town. And they actually put quite long strip trenches down people's gardens and burbage plots right the way down. And that's how they found some of these sea walls. We couldn't really kind of do that. They just got a big JCB in and took the top off. So we weren't, we weren't really kind of going that far. But we took the approach of using this idea of doing smaller trenches throughout the town to see what we could, we could, we could find. And there's a really good paper in the Proceedings of Antiquities of Scotland uh, about that excavation. Another, um, another time when some quite important things were uncovered was when um, the uh, main drainage works were done along uh, Broad Street and Castle Street and up towards uh, the, the junction with uh, um, Victoria Street and, and Tankless uh, Lane. Um, you can see maybe the idea about health and safety was slightly different in 1986, where you just got a man in a suit uh, holding a pole with somebody who looks like they've just got a bobble hat on, just kind of skitting down a very unstable looking, uh, with a raw sewage pipe just to their left, with two people standing at the top, which seems like a small, tiny barrier there and nothing else to stop anyone else falling down. But, but there you go, so at least we have moved on in terms of health and safety. What they uncovered here, digging this huge, great big, uh, uh, I think it was like a, a sort of sunk uh, tank. Right, you can see the steps of the cathedral there, so right in front of the cathedral is this rock, um, this bedrock here. And I think the machine has removed some of the bedrock here, but this edge here is the old, what was interpreted as the old, the old edge to the sea. So this gives us a really good tangible kind of marker in the town to say, yes, you know, looking at where the cathedral was built, right on the edge of the shore, boats potentially pulled up against it with a mason's yard just underneath where the museum is now. So some, some of these sort of more opportunistic sort of developer-led um, opportunities, and this was Raymond Lamb, who was the former county archaeologist, who um, uh, took these photographs and was the one that tried to record what he could before it was all backfilled. And that kind of unassuming uh, lot of rubble there is part of the broth that was, was exposed up at Spencer's DJ. And Raymond also observed they cut through some of the, um, the warning, which is interpreted as, on Castle Street, which was interpreted at the time as the castle, remains of the castle walls, and we'll, we'll show some photos of that in a moment, because we found where that, had, where that occurred recently. So there have been some really um, you know, significant findings. Um, this map is from a, a chapter in um, the Orkney English Saga book um, that uh, Raymond Lamb wrote with Judith Robertson. And what they did was that there's been lots of small like archaeological monitoring of, of, of little excavations of putting the pipe trench here, of digging, you know, developers doing such and such throughout the town. But actually when you look at the amount that's gone on over the last 20, 30 years, there has been quite a lot. And it does tell us about the old shoreline, it's told us about um, some of the medieval um, uh, you know, some some kind of construction to do with the, the medieval part of the town. Um, so I'm not going to go into massive de more detail about those. Um, there's been some sea walls that it's found as well. Uh, so that's a really useful publication to, to, to have a look at if you're interested in following some of that up. Um, so 
Moving on now, so there's a bit of a kind of potted history of the town trying to link that to some of the archaeological work that's gone on, which is really, considering the history of Kirkwall um, and the potential for some of the archaeology in Kirkwall, is actually very little. The only previous work and our work really has focused on um, the old shoreline, so there's still a lot of um, um, potential in the town to do some more. What I'm going to do now is just go through some of the activities that we did as part of the project to try and address some of this balance. So one thing that had, there has been very little of as, as well is, as, is building recording in the town, as I mentioned before. Um, so we recorded uh, three sites in the town, just to show what a basic, rapid um, building recording exercise could do. And then the results from this will all be then put on, into the national record, um, which you can view online in Canmore um, eventually, so that you know, this creates a kind of marker that we can, can monitor some of these buildings that are under threat. So we, we, uh, we looked at the so-called Parliament Square, which is just at the end of Bridge Street there, property to the rear of, uh, quite near the bank, on the other side of the road, Victoria Street, and 38 Main Street. So again, a nice spread through the town. And we identified these because they were effectively kind of buildings at risk, really. So Parliament Square, which is just behind, just off the Main Street, so-called because it was the site of a, one of the sort of team sites, or it was a, a Parliament site where it was apparently used up until quite recently in the sort of gap between um, the, the buildings here um, just to the left of where the guy with uh, the orange coat is standing, even up into the 18th century. It's where a lot of the political decisions were made um, in Orkney. Um, but just next to that, at the rear of uh, uh, number 10 Albert Street, you have, um, or number 6 Albert Street, sorry, you have the remains of quite an important uh, building. You can see up the top there, you've got a, a very old range that's had a more modern fireplace put into the middle there. You can see an old window, some of the moulded window surrounds the top there. Very fine doorway here, quite finely moulded uh, pillars up the side. Some of the windows have been blocked in recently. Um, but this is the sort of building that if you blink, it, you know, it, could, it could disappear. If people think, you, know, you kind of think it, it's something that, um, but even in the time that we've been looking at this site, there's been changes, you know, because a bit goes wobbly, and there's a lintel that goes wobbly, it gets taken off. And then there might be another kind of like period where it's, nothing much happens, and then suddenly a bit of wall collapses, and then what or goes and suddenly they're, they're gone. So it's why these kind of quite rapid recording exercises are really important, to sort of capture these sorts of sites before they, before they disappear. The site's currently used as a car park uh, back there, so it's just tarmacked on the inside. But the building probably dates to the sort of 16th, 17th century, it's a big... Uh, merchant townhouse, um, uh, and it's, you can just you can actually just kind of have a look up to that, that doorway. It's just on the corner of Bridge Street as you move round. So, in, in terms of building point, what we're doing is we're doing. You can see they've got the string line up there, so we're doing a very basic scale drawing of that doorway. We're taking a photographic record. You can see using scales like this and doing a very basic basic written description, which takes less than a day. So it's quite rapid. Um, and it enables you to just to record the state of that building and then that can be used as a sort of baseline and you can then monitor that, that building and record it if anything else happens to it. And at least if something does happen to it, you have a record. Um, another building that we looked at was just identified as an interesting one. It's just Spencer's news agency is just to your left. Um, Finn's old shop is just behind us, so it's just to the rear of that, which is now the vaping shop or something like that, isn't it? Uh, which uh, is a building that is, you know, the roof is sound, it's, 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 it's sort of, it's, it's, it's owned, it's cared for, it's uninhabited, but, you know, it's a, a building that you can see just by looking at some of the stonework that's been used there and how close it is to the cathedral. It's a building that contains a lot of reused medieval sandstone. So you've got a lot of yellow sandstone and a lot of red sandstone. Um, so the building itself is probably only 19th century, um, but we just undertook a basic uh, photographic and recording exercise of this elevation. But it's interesting to kind of, for something we've been doing in Bursley recently, is looking at where, you know, considering the town reuses and, you know, good stone is good stone, where does all the medieval material end up? Um, well, in Kirkwall, of course, around this area, you find a lot of it within later buildings. And then finally, um, we looked at 38 Main Street. Um, many of you may know it for the building on the right there, which is just around the corner there, is the Uppy Gold during the bar. So quite an icon, I mean, a really important building, and it's you know just for that reason in in the townscape. But just below that, at the base of that building, are some very old cellars. You can see some very low doorways underneath there. 
And then, actually, if you just look to the left there, looking in, you can see there's the remains of really quite old um, walling. Again, very finely moulded um, window surrounds there. And you can see an archway probably leading to a vaulted cellar under there. And it's known as the old, the old castle. Um, and again, it's one of these sort of buildings that there's very little of it left. There's a gap in the, the streetscape, which is probably, you know, uh, the buildings either side are probably sort of 18th, 19th century, apart from maybe the foundations of that one. Um, so we undertook again a brief, a rapid kind of photographic survey, uh, recording exercise on this, because again, it's, it's quite unstable. It's been repaired recently. More and more of it, um, uh, you know, is going, to dis is going to disappear, I imagine, fairly soon. That's just another view of it from the inside. You can see really fine old red sandstone, and that's on the back there. Um, so, what would the building have looked like? You wonder. When when did it last stand? Well, amazingly, not that long ago, because that was taken about the 1930s, and that's um, so that's that's the building with the upper gold just there, and there's those low doorways. This is the 19th century building to the to the, to the left there, um, and you can see what's probably in late medieval, possibly kind of early post-medieval, you know, substantial townhouse. Maybe some of the, the stonework was reused from the Bishop's Palace or other places in the town. Um, but unfortunately it was demolished in the 1950s and the stone was used on the Mans Park housing estate because it was almost just seen as un unstable and, you know, unsightly. Um, but even, so you can see even quite, you know, significant changes have occurred at that end of the town in the last, uh, well, 100 years. So, uh, geophysical survey. So, I'll describe briefly what the different techniques are because I won't assume that everybody knows about them. We did, um, we used three different techniques in the town. So, using a combination of techniques in the same area is often a good idea because you can compare the results. Because if you just do use one technique, it just shows you one set of results. You might then do it, excavate, and you actually find that there's quite a lot of stuff there. So taking one technique as red is maybe not the best idea. So we had the opportunity to use three techniques. So magnetometry, which detects very tiny differences in magnetism in the ground. So in terms of archaeology, you're looking at plus one, two, three, four nanotesla. But of course, if you've got steel toe cap boots on, your toe caps will cancel those really uh, low uh, uh, responses out. And, some archaeologists have done a day's work and they realise that. Um, but it's quite a useful technique to cover large areas. It's maybe not so useful in the town where you might have kind of lots of bits of metal or bits of made ground that, that might give you lots of different signals. But it's worth a try anyway. Earth resistance is, you may have seen, um, I'll show you, that you, you basically put two prongs in the ground and you send a charge through the ground and it detects low and high resistance in the ground. So if you've got lots of stone, the charge can't get through. If you've got a deep, dark, a deep kind of wet ditch, the charge goes through really quickly. And you just look at those over an area. Um, so it's good for picking up walls and that sort of thing. So it's good for maybe for sort of urban archaeology. And GPR is ground penetrating radar. So that is a good technique for looking at structures and looking much deeper. So that can go down to five, six, seven meters. Um, whereas these other techniques are maybe only the top meter, meter and a half. So we looked at. Uh, three areas that I'm going to talk about today. Um, we did another area, we did, we did a bit of um, the garden just to the south of the Arvis Bank here, and we actually also did number 75 Victoria Street down there. I'm sorry, Spencer, it wasn't, it wasn't, that, it wasn't that kind of like spectacular result, so I haven't talked about that tonight. So, but, uh, <laughs> so we did, I'll show you some of the results in these areas, and we can look at what the different um, responses we got. So we're just going to look at the historical mapping for this area here, because of course this is in the garden of the museum, which is now quite a large green space. But as you'll see from just looking back 100 or so years, it's another space that's changed quite a lot. Because um, if we look at the historical mapping, here's the RBS bank. So that's where we were, one of the areas we're looking at. Here's the museum. And you can see you've got a whole set of buildings here. This is the gardens for the museum. Um, and there's Tampanis Lane. Um, there's the old um, uh, town hall as well. But, so those buildings there aren't, aren't there anymore. So even in that um, space, you've had some quite rapid changes. And if you just look at that next map in 1902, you can see those buildings have, have disappeared. Um, probably they're probably residential buildings. They're probably to do with um, the uh, 
Tankman's house, probably service quarters. Um, uh, they reused a lot of red sandstone again. So we had an interesting, can we pick up traces of these buildings in, in, in our geophysical surveys? And are there any other kind of structures or features that might show up that we could, we could, we could look at? Because we were hoping to do this and then find some features that we could actually then target with excavation. But we're still we're looking at kind of you know needle in a haystack sort of stuff. We're just kind of responding to areas that we've got access to. So magnetometry, I'll just explain the technique. That's the equipment there. So in those tubes, you've got two, you've got a flux gate magnetometer in each one, and you just you kind of set out grids with these pegs and you walk up and down taking readings and you join all those together to make basically a map of that area with highs and lows. Um, so we did what we could in the Tankless House Gardens um, there. And so the results are looking like, look like this. So you can see we've marked on areas with kind of higher response. Um, as I said before, magnetometry doesn't necessarily work particularly well in an urban environment just because you've got so much kind of material. Um, it's, it, it, you know, there's so much noise, if you like, that it's difficult to make stuff out. But in, down in the RBS bank, we did, lo and behold, we did pick up this kind of long linear feature here, which you can see shows up as quite a, a, a negative white response, linear response, um, which is, which, you know, given the fact that it's in an urban environment, it's quite interesting that we did pick that up uh, with the magnetometry. The other area is, no, you know, there's bits of disturbance which might relate to those structures that we saw on the map, but nothing more really conclusive. Earth resistance, so that's the, the instrument there, so it has these little prongs and you have to kind of put them in the ground and then it sends a charge to, again you do it on a grid, it's a little bit slower, um, but uh, we had, to, you needed slightly, you know, reasonably large area, because if you've just got a tiny area, not really, it's, not, it's quite difficult to make out um, what you're actually looking at, because you may just have a few contrasting responses, but you've got no real context to put it in, so that's one of the disadvantages of doing that in this sort of environment. Um, but lo and behold, we did pick up some responses here. Um, looking at some of the historical records for the garden, there was, a, there was a tennis court in the garden. We know there were these former buildings, which it looks like we're picking up some of the remains of. And on the old maps, there's a big boundary wall that runs across there, which looks like we might have uh, been picking up there with that linear anomaly running off there. Might have got old um, flower beds and stuff as well showing up in this technique. Um, so this is where I would, if we hadn't had the Jutland embargo, uh, I would have probably put a trench across that big linear feature there and maybe taken in a bit of those structures to try and find out what they are, but maybe we'll have to save that one for the future. Um, but in the RBS bank, that white linear feature that you saw there um, also shows up in the resistance as a very strong linear feature um, very high response. So high response means it's probably quite a lot of stone, so it could be a structure, but it could be a drain. It's flowing, you know, down slope towards where the former shore was. So you know, intriguing. But um, so this was the only area we could put our larger trench in because we had permission from RBS to do it. Um, so and we were doing this in real time with the, the school kids from KGS. So we were like, right, where would you put a trench then if this is the only place that you? And they were like. Oh, over here, and it's like, what about there? So, we, uh, we were doing it in real time with them as well, which was great because we didn't know what this was going to be. We were going into the school and trying to get them, you know, showing them all the evidence that we had to try and help us target where we put our trenches, and then they were going to come out and do the excavation with us as well. But we'll come on to that in a moment. Um, so, ground penetrating radar. That's the, we've got a couple of sensors like that. So again, you're doing it on a grid, but the wheel tracks the distance. You drag that along and it sends radar waves down on the ground, which bounce off structures. It's not so good for deposits, but it's good for structures. Um, so this was another opportunity to kind of like um, corroborate some of these things that we were seeing in the resistance. So there's us in LBS Bank Garden. And what you end up with are basically a whole series of slices through the ground where you drag it along. And you can see you get these different reflections in these series of slices. And then you get a bit of software that basically just joins them all together. And then you can look at them in slices horizontally rather than vertically. And if you do it the other way, then you can, as well, you can actually build up a really detailed model of what's below the ground. Um, so we did some for, in the museum gardens, but we only did a couple of transects. But interestingly, in the um, RBS Bank Garden, we also picked up 
this linear feature here. So this was looking pretty good as being something pretty substantial. So surprise, surprise, when we came to do our excavations, we indeed put our trench across, across there. Um, and this was our kind of first phase of excavations there. And we had, um, we had a whole team, a team of volunteers, students, and we had uh, um, about 105 <coughs> S3 students come down and help on, on several days. So it was a, it was a, it was a busy, busy trench. Um, so we were very, very relieved when we actually when we actually started to find that there was actually going to be something there that we could excavate. So um, you can see our trench there, and we had all the boarding to try and um, look after the grass. Um, of course, in the topsoil and stuff, we're finding it's an urban environment, we're finding lots of material that people have been um, discarding. And of course, this was a bank, so the bank manager lived upstairs. Um, and a lot of the finds, the kind of the bank, the, per the, bank, the, the residential part of the bank was sort of, wasn't used from sort of the early 19th century, uh, sorry, the early 20th century, and that's kind of when the finds sort of stop about that point. Um, we found even found gun cartridges in the garden, so when they were taking pot shots at pigeons, I don't know. But, um, so we were very pleased to see uh, things emerging from our trench. Um, and this was, this was really a really good opportunity to, you know, had signs on the street, really had hundreds of people come through the excavations as we were doing them. We were sieving all the soil at the top there, which was a great thing for the kids to be doing as well. And we were washing all the finds on site. Um, so it was a hive activity for just over a week. Um, yeah, and it was a real, really good opportunity to, as I said, like to take kids through sort of real time. Uh, we, were, we, we didn't know what we were going to find. They thought we were setting it all up for them, but we were, we were doing it as it, as it occurred. Um, and we had over really 300 pupils through from, from secondary schools and primary schools during that time, um, which is a real success and getting them involved and actually digging in the trench. Um, and we did even find uh, a, a prehistoric flint scraper. One of the kids found a pre flint scraper, which was in this, one of the sieves, which is a, so you know, we're just off where that Iron Age block is, where that prehistoric activity is. So we are picking up little traces of that, even in this, even in these deposits um, around, around the bank. So this is what has started to emerge. This is our, this is right in the line of where our geophysical features were. This kind of line of, line of slabs, we thought well, maybe it's a sort of paved surface. Um, but the more we dug down, the more it started to sort of take shape. Um, and then there's some of the team. It got wetter and wetter as we went down, which is good. And Scott will talk about that in a bit. Um, so you can see there's quite a substantial wall right on that line starting to emerge. Um, and there's Chris. The water started to come. I don't think we were at the water table. I think it was water started to actually just come out of the structure itself. But you can see quite a substantial structure um, emerged. And you can see it's not not got the finest wall face, but this was this this still carried on down. Uh, so the, it's over over a meter wide, over a meter deep, a very substantial wall. And going on the geophysics, it carries on for a, a long way. So an intriguing structure to find but what could it be? Um, and if we go back to our map, this is where we are here. So we're right behind <coughs> the bank there. We're very close to the street. Um, so this is, this is the early 19th century. So we're, we're really close. And the, the building number seven, Victoria Street, has what we call the sea gates in the cellar. So the sea would be right up to the back of these, these buildings, probably in the sort of late medieval early point, you know, 16th, 17th century um, period. So, um, and as I was saying earlier, you note know, these sort of walkways running across here, but there's nothing really showing up here, and we're kind of in the slightly deeper part of the, the PDC there. So we're interpreting that as some form of pier, or maybe a kind of wharf structure. But of course, the disadvantage we had is we only had one very small trench across it. Um, but we did get some interesting deposits around it, which Scott's going to talk about. Um, most of the finds we got, of course, were what you'd find when you're digging in your garden in Kirkwall. But you may just think, oh, well, you know, you know, it's just a load of old modern rubbish. But 
nobody's, this is, this is the stuff that's really lacking in the museum. This is the stuff that nobody's really looked at at all in the town. But Gavin looked at it in the, in the, in the, in the 60s, but they didn't really even look at some of the modern stuff. So in terms of, we're still kind of like working out how we're going to um, transfer some of this material to the museum. But we're looking forward to working with the museum to kind of get some of this more modern material from our excavations, um, you know, into their archives. Um, but this is great stuff for the kids because it's, okay, it's a bit sharp some of it, but, you know, they can actually engage with it. It's not like a crumbly piece of Neolithic pot, which, you know, nobody can touch because it's so delicate. And, you know, this is stuff that you can hand around, this is stuff that they can wash and they can really engage with. So it's really fantastic for that sort of thing. And of course we did, yeah, I spoiled my, still my thunder earlier, but we did find a, a, a prehistoric scraper, just, you know, it is all me after all. It's probably a near, it's a near settlement underneath there somewhere. But you can see the little kind of flakes taken out around the edge. We did get a few pieces of film, didn't we, um, throughout <laughs> our work. But up against this big wall, we also found, you can see them squelching in it earlier, we found some really interesting waterlogged deposits. And when we were digging down, we realised that there were actually quite a lot of um, plant remains preserved within these deposits. Because, of course, if you've got waterlogged deposits, you've got anaerobic conditions, the plant material doesn't rot away. So we could see there was some potential there to look at um, plant remains and potentially look at, tell, say something about the, the early environment around this structure. Um, so that's where my colleague Scott Timpany comes in, because he has these very large tins that he uh, hits with a rubber, rubber hammer, very delicate. But I'll, I'll, I'll hand over to Scott, who's going to talk you through what he's doing there and what results we got. Okay, <clears throat> so when Dan was digging this, I was sat in the office uh, and he must have phoned through to Mary, and Mary had one of those Ghostbusters moments. Got one, you know, on the phone. Uh, and we went down in our Ghostbusters van slash Orca vehicle uh, to go and take some uh, samples through this layer. So what we were trying to do is see if this would give us a snapshot of the landscape of the environment around the time of this structure and maybe just before, or structure, wharf, uh, whatever. And because we've got this really nice waterlogged deposit, it means, as Dan could say, we could see visible plant remains within it. We could see some straw things at the bottom. Uh, we could see bits of bone. You can see sort of bits of bone things sticking out, uh, out of the silt. So we had this really nice organic band at the base of the tin, uh, and a silt layer, and then you can see that darker organic band at the top. So we thought this would be a perfect place uh, to sample this material and see if we can get things like these out of it. So we sampled this for the four main things really. Uh, the plant remains, which we haven't quite looked at yet, so the, <laughs> the seeds uh, and that, but also the micro fossils. So I'm just going to give you the results of the micro fossil work that we did. Uh, so we looked at some pollen grains. Uh, so uh, most flowering plants produce pollen, uh, and when you get nice anaerobic sediments, that pollen, when it floats around the atmosphere and settles, sticks there. So as you can imagine, those sediments building up through time, at each of those levels, you get a snapshot of what the landscape used to look at through time. So if you put that all together through very deep deposits, I mean, normally they've been up to sort of six, seven meters, you get really massive sequences of how that landscape's changed. So right back from uh, the late glacial time, right the way up potentially to, to modern times. So this was a chance to kind of look at that. Uh, pollen is very different, so most trees, flowering plants, have different kind of grains, they have different structure and they're different shapes. So you can see at the top that's elm pollen, it's kind of a 50 pence shape. Uh, on each of the corners it has a little pore, uh, but it has a surface pattern that looks a bit like the human brain. So it's quite a regular, uh, so it's quite distinct in that way. And you can see other pollen grains are slightly different. So this is wayfaring tree, uh, and this has more of an oval shape, and it's got the furrows on it that you can see, and you can see just breaks in those furrows, those are the pores. And that has a pattern uh, on that that looks like a mesh, like a net pattern. So you can see surface structure is different. Some have pores, some have furrows, uh, and we can use that to create a picture of what the different tree types were by looking at those percentages. So they're really good at looking at a more regional signal, but they can also be quite good at looking at local signals as well. Uh, and you can also use them to see how people have interacted with that environment. So have they cleared areas of woodland for farming? Uh, what kind of crops are they growing? Is it a heathland environment? Uh, all of this different information. And alongside these, we look at things called spores. 
uh, or non-pollen palynomorphs, or NPPs, and essentially these are things that can see on the pollen side, but they're not pollen grains. So these are things like fungal spores, so you can see some fungal spores here. Uh, you can see again, they're all very different as well, so we can count these alongside our pollen, and they might give us indications, for example, so Sarcophora one, the one that looks like a little torpedo, that's dung fungi. So if we see if we've got animals present in the landscape, for example, uh, if we're near livestock or grazing environments, or if we were uh, sampling from the floor of a building, it might be a buyer, etc., then we'd expect to see quite a lot of dung fungi. Uh, and also things like uh, Galacinospora, which is a dry indicator. So if you've had heathland and fires and that sort of thing, and in that drier deposit, you get these spores. So they all add more information. So we're not just looking at pollen, we're looking at sort of everything on that slide. And the other thing we want to look at is charcoal. So as well as pollen, as well as spores, that's <laughs> what it takes along. You can also see uh, fragments of charcoal, and this gives us an indication of whether there's been burning going on in that environment, for example. So uh, it might have been a heathland fire that was loads of burning. If you were near a structure or, or occupation, you might get, you know, from the Mesolithic, burning related to small occupation camps, or you might get uh, larger burning if you're next to a Bronze Age settlement, Iron Age settlement, for example, as well. And sometimes they retain structure. So what that means is that often, you'll, I'll show you a photo later of charcoal, it's, it looks like a jagged shard. It's got sharp edges because uh, it's broken off, but sometimes they retain the structure from the wood or the grass or the reed, etc., that they come from. So we can tell that not only is the something being burnt, there's a burning event, but also maybe what is being burnt. So is it wood that's being burnt? Is it grasses? Is it reeds, etc.? Uh, and you can see at the top there, you can make out those bars. So it looks a bit like those piers going across the <laughs> PVC. Uh, but that's the bars of what, something that's called a scalariform plate. So you get to learn all these great words today. Uh, and it's essentially it's an oval shape, and it has these bars going across it. And the trees that have that, things like birch, things like alder, uh, hazel has them too, but the gap is much wider. Uh, and then other things like holly, etc. So you can sort of start seeing maybe what's being burned. Uh, and as you can see the bottom one there, it looks a bit like a bran flake. Uh, but if we, if we kind of looked up, you can maybe just make out that in between those squares, there's two or three little circles. It's quite difficult to see. Uh, but just in here, there's a square, and there's two circles, and there's two circles. And that's what coniferous wood looks like. <coughs> so that's not a uh, citrus tree, that's a coniferous tree. Uh, that actually came from Otterswick, uh, from the Mesolithic peak of Otterswick in the submerged forest. Uh, <coughs> and that's fir, which didn't grow around me. So <laughs> that's potentially people burning driftwood in the Mesolithic. So even though it's just one tiny fragment of charcoal, it still tells us a story, it still gives us more information to go along with what we're looking at. So we want to tie all that in, in, in together. Uh, we've got the sediments, so we want to see if we can get a snapshot of that environment. Uh, why is that important as well? Well, in terms of Orkney, this is uh, a figure that uh, Michelle Farrell did as part of her PhD. She did a synthesis of all the pollen studies that have been done on Orkney when she's doing her own pollen studies here. Uh, and this is the number of pollen studies, uh, and as you can see beside there, that's a slice through time. So you can see from 12,000 BC all the way up to pretty much the modern day. And you can see there's quite a few studies that cover from the Lake Glacial all the way up to the Holocene, uh, <coughs> to, the, to where we are today. And there's quite a few that cover parts of that. Yeah, and where there's a broken line, that's where we think, you know, we've got dates, but the dates might not be right. So it potentially covers that period of time, or, or maybe it doesn't. But if we're looking at the period we're interested in with this, you can see that there's very few pollen studies in Orkney that actually cover this period of time. So the kind of early medieval, medieval, post-medieval isn't that well covered in terms of uh, the pollen evidence. So that kind of landscape picture, we've got a very good landscape picture of the Neolithic, of the Bronze Age, of the Iron Age, but when we get actually uh, close to where we are in time, uh, we don't really know so much about it. So, you know, were people exploiting those early woodland back? You know, were people exploiting that? Were they managing that? Uh, is there lots of agriculture going on? Uh, Etc. So that was, you can see there was about four or five uh, studies that kind of covered into that period. So if we look at where Michelle's mapped them, uh, we can see, oh, it's black in there, but we can see that uh, they're all kind of West Mainland. Uh, there's one uh, down uh, Scapa, which might or may not cover that period, uh, but they're all kind of away 
from Kirkwall. So Kirkwall, we don't really have much bio information there. There's been a few more since Michelle did a study. Indeed, one Michelle did herself at Hobbister, and we've got a new one at Tukoi, which definitely covers the Norse period against the medieval period. Uh, but there isn't anything for Kirkwall. So this maybe give us uh, a new record that we could see that landscape change uh, and things going on in that landscape. So we had a look down the microscope. This is what it looks like when we look down the microscope, down with your eyes. Uh, and you can see some pollen grains. So this is the sort of thing that was coming out of the slides that we looked at. So this one was pretty dominant throughout. This looks like four balls stuck together. This is heather pollen. So if you're in the middle of a heathland, then you get a lot of heather pollen. This one's quite good. This is mugwort. Uh, it looks like three sausages. Can you see the sausages on the sides stuck together? Yeah, those are the furrows. And uh, there's little pores within those. So that's a nice herbaceous type that we had. At the base we had loads of this, uh, so you can see these are, are quite round, but they're also quite large. So every one of these is two and a half microns, but they're, so they're about 35, 40 microns. They're round and they've got one pore. They're quite big, so they're twice the size of these little pollen grains. This is cereal pollen, so there's loads of cereal pollen ticking near the base, which is good. Uh, this is alder, it looks like a star, it's 50 pence, and you can just see it's got these Arky, so in between the pores, it has these curves that come around. It's quite a nice pollen grain. That's an alder, so you know there was a bit of them around, <laughs> maybe a couple of trees. Uh, these are dung fungi, uh, so you can see this one here, which looks a bit like the top of the torpedo, that red kind of shape as well. That's Spora myella, uh, and then if you see this one that looks like a rug ball. There's actually two of them uh, on that. That's Sordaria type as well. So we've got again dung fungi evidence potentially for livestock around uh, and then loads of this so this is charcoal that doesn't retain structure but you can see how it's really black and it's really sharp you can see all those angles coming up as well uh, and essentially the bigger the charcoal that you've got the closer you are to the fire so if there was in situ burning and we we're on a heathland we expect loads of charcoal all of that kind of large size as well as the smaller stuff if we were well away from it then we just get the smaller stuff floating to us, so it kind of, you know, uh, it's demonstrable by uh, the wind, blown by the wind, uh, onto our side. So these are the kind of things we did. We did 12 levels through that site, so we mainly did it quite close interval sampling through the top uh, organic layer and through the bottom organic layer, and then in the middle of that was that silt, and we didn't do too much to the silt. Uh, but this is a, a, the, the diagram we've got. So the, the zones basically are, this is the bottom level where the organic is, and that's the top organic level. Uh, and in between that is the kind of silt. Uh, so the green is the tree pollen, as you can see. There's not a lot of tree pollen. <laughs> Trees are pretty much gone, uh, as, it, as you do see in Orby. Uh, so this is all together. This is uh, what you put the total pollen. So, so the green is the trees and the herbs. The red is the heathland taxa, so lots and lots of heather. Uh, and the yellow is the herbaceous plants. Uh, and then you can see a bit of purple. These are our dung fungi. And then the black is the charcoal as well. So you can already start seeing that from uh, all of those layers. It looks very much like a real heathland environment in the middle of town. <laughs> it's a bit like. Uh, <coughs> And in that layer at the bottom, that organic layer, where we started seeing, I think, sort of straw and things, so we're quite interested in that. We want to get that in the tip uh, and take samples through that. Uh, you can actually see that that corresponds with what we've got in the pollen, because this is barley pollen, and the other one is uh, cereal pollen, so it's pollen that's the right size for a cereal grain, but it's not quite the right size for barley pollen. Uh, and you can also see uh, a big peak uh, in Sporomyella sort of the top at the bottom. So we've got dung fungi, so particularly it's animal dung knocking around in that, in, as part of that stuff. Uh, there's also a lot of cereals, and you can see that's where heather starts taking off as well at the bottom, but there's hardly any trees uh, at all. But there's quite a lot of charcoal, so there's quite a lot of burning evidence uh, as well here. And as we go through, uh, it gets quite interesting because we lose the cereals. So into the next level, there's no cereal pollen, the cereal pollen stops. Uh, and we start seeing a bit of an increase in tree pollen, so that's where tree pollen starts coming in a bit more. Uh, and it's birch there, and you've also got uh, coming in uh, things like crowberry, and of course it's still dominated completely by heather pollen, so lots of those four balls stuck together is what we're seeing in the microscope. 
Towards the top of that silver layer, there's an increase in the grasses, so the waste area of the grasses. There's a decline in the amount of charcoal, so it's just as a decrease in burning. Uh, and then there's an increase in, in heather uh, as well, get on there, and a slight increase in crowberry, which is uh, in petrol, uh, over the side there. And then into that top layer, that top organic layer, uh, you can see there's still some tree pollen, and actually tree pollen does increase within that one, uh, going up. Uh, grasses definitely increase, there's a decline in heather, uh, and also we start seeing a few more dung fungi coming through. But interestingly, there's also a lot of sphagnum moss in that level as well. So we've got mosses, we've got heathland taxa, uh, we've got grasses, we've got an increase, uh, with two peaks at least, uh, in, in microscopic charcoal, and we also see a few dung fungi. Uh, coming through as well. So, so, <laughs> so the pollen suggests at this point that you know that around that structure is heathland, uh, there's grassland. Uh, at the bottom there's definitely cereal activities going on. So maybe cereal processing or keeping of crops or something next to that structure. So we thought, great, it sort of makes sense. It's sort of heathland. It's not quite what we expected uh, around there, but we'll get some radiocarbon dates uh, as well. So we took radiocarbon date from the bottom of the organic layer and the top and bottom of the top organic layer. And these are the dates that we got. Uh, so we got 7th century, 9th century, and then 5th century. Uh, so really carbon dating didn't really quite work here. Uh, this is it plotted, so this is the depth down the side, it's depth OD, uh, and these were our three dates are. So at the bottom, uh, it suggests that that uh, organic layer uh, comes in uh, there, which is AD 611-655. Then we go up and we've got a nice progression, so we should get a, you know, a date that's sort of younger at the top. And then we've got a quite old date at the bottom. So the dates kind of make nonsense in the bottom diagram, uh, in a way. Uh, and it seems that what we have here, because what's the if you go by the maps that Dan was showing, what's the problem with all of those dates in this location? Should have been water, shouldn't it? <laughs> so, so, so we shouldn't have dates that here. So thinking back then to our section, you know, what we might have here then is a series of made ground deposits, and the material that we've got is coming from elsewhere and being dumped to make this ground up to, you know, to, to reach, retake back some of that land uh, that the sea had claimed. Now, I think the cereal pollen stuff, which is right down the bottom, so it's actually below uh, where the ranging pollen is, the cereal in there is good, you know, so I think that probably is in situ. I think what we've got is we've got a date, because we took a date from the peaks and stuff, from the organic lights, rather than the seeds, which we haven't done yet, which is a bit, a bit daft really, I suppose. But uh, we took the dates from those, uh, thinking that we've probably got quite a nice sequence because it looks all right, doesn't it? Sort of organic ways. Uh, and we were hoping for like nice medieval dates and sort of post medieval because that's the kind of period we wanted, that's the kind of period that we don't have that information for. So, what it looks like is that we've got definitely, we've probably got serial activities associated with the structure. So, we've probably got barley, etc., being brought in. There probably is animals or animal dung, etc., being used around that area uh, as well. Uh, <coughs> so, that's probably okay, and the date that we've got is probably from the ground surface that that stuff's been, you know, so it's the, what people are walking on, and then that crop processing activity is taking place on that main ground surface. But they've got this build-up of material, which is very silty, uh, and it does contain uh, anthropogenic material, it contains big bits of charcoal, bone, uh, etc. as well, and then you can quite clearly see that band, uh, can't you? Uh, and that band, so there's the cereal pollen, uh, and then we've got this, these layers here, so we've potentially got something here that, where that uh, organic band is. I think one line's making it worse, actually. Uh, where that organic band is, so we've probably got another layer coming in there. And it looks like what the people have been doing is taking material from heathland environments, so potentially uh, from uh, heathland nearby, uh, and then using that and dumping it on top of that probably quite unstable ground layer there, which was the silt, which had a lot of material trapped within it. Uh, and making another layer. So we've got, potentially got maybe not information that's telling us a lot about the landscape, because it's probably telling us about three distinct periods of landscape that actually may not relate to the structure at all <laughs> uh, in terms of where it's been taken from, so it's trial and error. Uh, but we might have captured within that 
spots of activity that are associated with what's going on. So I think the, in terms of the agricultural activity down the bottom, I think that's okay. And then essentially we've got people transferring material to make land services. So within that, we've probably got a very mixed signal. Uh, and it's interesting in its own way, because until you get dates and uh, things, you can't tell from the pollen diagram. If you look at that, uh, hay, uh, sorry, a heather curve, for example, it just looks continuous. You know, it looks totally fine. But when you think about it, that's three distinct layers on top of each other, and yet it's very similar uh, in terms of what it's showing you. So here at the bottom of the cereal, it's probably in association with that wharf area, and people bringing in cereals, etc., into that area. Uh, then we've got uh, accumulation of material, which probably is in situ. It'd be good to get maybe a couple of dates from things that are within that. Uh, and then we've got dumping of, of heath and heather on top of that. So a bit mixed results. Uh, yeah, so I think the next thing really is for us to kind of work out from uh, the uh, macro fossils if we've got any evidence of things that are maybe are more in situ than, than some of that problem. Uh, so not quite the record we hope for, but there's definitely something I'm not going to <coughs> Thanks very much, Scott. So, yeah. It was, again, it's all, like Scott was saying, it's trial and error, trying, trying to use different techniques um, when we have the opportunity within the town. So, we're still, yeah, there's still a, a story to unfold, I think, from the paleo environmental evidence. Um, so, back to our excavations, I was just going to run through some of the other activities before looking at some of the more recent things we've been doing. So, our garden date was in. Uh, August 2016 and we just got a general call out to local residents to see uh, who was up for digging a hole in their garden basically and amazingly this incredibly regular pattern of people volunteered right up from um, unfortunately we didn't end up getting to dig the St. Olaf's wide trench because it involved cutting concrete and it was going to get very complicated so unfortunately we didn't do that one but we did uh, test a bit on Albert Street quite close to where um, McGavin did stuff. We had a trench in the BBC uh, Radio Watney Gardens just off Castle Street. So my, my hook for the kids was to, we'll find maybe find bits of the castle. But um, let's see. Um, we did a, a trench in Palace Gardens. I'm not going to talk about that tonight because we basically hit some services and we didn't really find anything particularly significant. We did find some medieval pottery. Uh, 7 Victoria Street and then right down um, 80 Victoria Street on the other side of the road. So all of those were on the kind of shore side of the road. Victoria Street Trench was, uh, was uh, on the other side of the road. And then more recently, which I mentioned at the end, we actually did some work in um, Blyde Trust Garden, which is just, just in the middle of Victoria Street there, which I'll talk about later. Um, so this is, this is us just doing, basically just doing test pits, doing trial test pits um, into the ground, um, basically just, just, to see, just to see what we find, see which layers we find, um, recover artefacts and get a kind of snapshot through the town. So excavations in, uh, in 41 Albert Street, we, we, we basically found big ground. We didn't find any structures, we found a sequence of layers, silts and clays, which took us down to um, a depth of about a metre before we stopped. Um, we had some really nice finds, so we had some nice clay pipes, probably sort of early 19th century. We had this very intriguing thing, which we're interpreting as maybe a fishing weight loom weight, I don't know if anyone else has seen anything like that before, but really quite finely made, very kind, finely kind of carved, with a lovely little hole hit, well, right through the middle, but that is actually a hole that runs through the top there. Um, so even in those small testaments, we were getting some really nice finds. Uh, 7 Victoria Street, so right next to the RBS bank. Unfortunately, the flowers and the, the wine weren't for us. Uh, they were on their way out, but I, I got the photo anyway. But again, here we found a whole sequence of made ground deposits. Um, so again, interesting to look at these different layers that Scott's been talking about, the build-up of material, rapid or not. Um, amazingly, in the ground there, we found um, an ivory chest piece, uh, which is really, really fragile, and quite a miracle that survived. So little traces of people playing games in the garden, probably in the sort of 18th, 19th century. A lot of what we found there, a lot of animal bone, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, bottles, all the kind of detritus and rubbish that's kind of caught up within some of these deposits. 
Um, the BBC Trench, which was the one just there, just off Castle Street, very close to the castle site, so you never know what you might find. We dug a slightly larger trench in the back of their garden there, and that was our kind of public facing trench because a lot of residents didn't want maybe want lots of people traipsing into, into the gardens. So that was a really good opportunity for us for, to get folks to come and have a, have, do some excavation again, a bit like we did in the RBS Bank Garden. Um, so there's a nice artist impression there. This is the kind of best we have, really, although of course it's an artist impression. But you can see the cathedral on the front there. You've got the Castle Yards, which was across where Broad Street is now, across to where um, the real is, and then the substantial castle just there. Of course, we don't know exactly the layout of that. Um, there it shows a wall along the, the street frontage and a very, very strong keep um, behind that. But it just gives you that sense of what you know, medieval Kirkwall would have been like. Um, and of course, the, the shore, the, the sea, just literally just beyond that. Um, but we'll come back to the castle in a bit. Um, so we dug a smaller trench there, again, sieving the ground, uh, sieving all the soil, taking it down uh, layer by layer. Again, most of what we were finding was sort of uh, 19th century material, lots of blue and white pottery, shells, animal bone. But the further we went down, the more of this we started to find. And this was quite a, this is the, the nicest piece of uh, animal bone we found. It was a big, big pig jaw, big boar's jaw, uh, quite worn teeth. Um, we, down in this trench we found hundreds and hundreds of fragments of animal bone, over 500 in the trench in total. Um, which you can see us washing on, on site at the time. Um, what we're finding, the analysis of those, there's pig, there's sheep, um, there's cow, there's quite a lot of pig further down. So the story is that Volcadians have always liked a bacon sandwich. <laughs> um, a lot of the animal bones have uh, butchery marks on them, a lot of the ribs have been cut and chopped. Um, Sheep's pelvises have been chopped, so we're and, and we're actually very close to the flesh market, which was the, the, the basic town abattoir, if you like, in the in the in the in the 18th century, late 18th century, um, before it was moved. It, there was a lot of complaints, and the town council moved the abattoir to the shores of the PDC as it was extending out. So we've got a very a rare kind of um, assemblage of material. It's rare to have such a substantial animal bone assemblage from that period, but from quite an important site where we have a very tight uh, time range, uh, I can't remember the exact date off the top of my head, but the time range of the, uh, the, um, the, the site there, so that would give us a, that bone still being analysed, so that would give us a really good insight into that kind of period of the town's history. Um, and yeah, we had an open day, we had several hundred people come, come by, lots of activity, finds washing and all sorts of things, so it was a really nice opportunity to share um, the uh, uh, the trench and the, the project with everyone. And then in Victoria Street, which was down the other end of town, you can see we're slightly up from the street, slightly higher ground. Um, another one of these one-by-one one test pits was excavated. And there we found a sequence of sort of topsoil layers that basically went down with the clay. So a very different story on that side of the street. Um, again, we found similar sorts of artifacts, uh, more modern material, and I think the highlight was maybe a suspender uh, a clip which has obviously fallen off some washing uh, which was on, on the line. That was my favourite. Uh, so quite a different story on that side of the street. Um, but just jumping to another project that we did last year and finished off this year, we did a similar thing linking in with the Kirkland THI project with the Bly Trust. Uh, we got some lottery funding and we did an um, Archaeology Plus project where we did a sort of whole series of um, archive archaeology and art workshops with members of the Blight Trust um, in their lovely gardens, which was fantastic. And we dug another test pit, sort of a slightly larger test pit, just up on that sort of raised area uh, to, the, to the east side of Victoria Street. So another interesting opportunity to compare with 80 Victoria Street there. And uh, of course, we, we had a look around, sniff around the walls, and lo and behold, we're finding lots of really finely moulded bits of red sandstone that have probably come from the cathedral or the um, uh, Bishop's Palace. Um, the sort of material we're finding from there, this is part, part of it, we had a pop-up uh, photo lab in the garden where we were recording and uh, photographing some of the, 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 the finds as we went. Similar sort of artefacts you'd expect, 18th, 19th century pottery. But as we went down, we started to get a lot more animal bone. And then near the bottom, we found um, this, can you see there's actually lines marked on it. This is a piece of red sandstone about this big. So at the bottom of that, we're actually finding worked red sandstone. So if you remember back to the um, stuff we found underneath uh, that was found by McGavin 
um, in, the, in the 70s underneath Tankless House. Just, just you know, we're a lot closer to um, the, 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 the cathedral here. We're finding work red sandstone. And we didn't find a kind of soil horizon below that. Um, we found a kind of edge, and we think we might have come down to a cut feature or something, so maybe a, a big pit or a bank. So we're getting medieval material even that far down on that, on that edge of the town there. So that in, for a very small hole, uh, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was pretty useful. <coughs> so just to show you some pictures of some of the recent things, because of course this links in with the Kirkwood THI, because it was part of the THI project, was to uh, redo the street at the end of uh, Castle Street here. Um, so the castle, we're literally looking bang on to where the castle uh, would have been. Um, if, for those of you who don't know, there's a nice plaque in the wall there you can, you can read um, that commemorates that. But you know, this was this was a different sort of archaeology. This is a, this is an advanced development. So um, as part of this this development, there were archaeologists monitoring just because of the archaeological sens sen sensitivity of the area. Um, and in this part of it here, started to unearth. Um, some quite substantial walls running along the street edge here. And then you'll just see where the archaeologists there. This is where we found the remains of the castle. And luckily for us, this didn't hold up any of the works because the works had to shut this street anyway. They carried on down here whilst we could deal with the, I say we, colleagues of mine, were, were, were excavating the remains there. Um, so uh, the walls along here weren't so convincing as to be a really substantial wall for the castle. Found a number of sort of more ephemeral walls running along here, about a metre wide perhaps. Um, so we're not quite sure on whether that's like a boundary wall for the castle. Um, there's old etchings with like a boundary wall there with the ruins. I should have put one of those in actually if I didn't put them in at all. There's another view looking back that way, various cobbled surfaces, and quite a surprising amount of archaeology you can see literally just underneath the current street. Um, quite a lot of cultural material coming out of there, 19th century stuff. Quite a lot of uh, fish bone even, so that's, that material is still being worked through at the moment, so it'll be interesting to see what, what comes out of those samples. This is a picture of one of those walls that runs along the, free, the street frontage there. Um, so you can see some quite substantial walls, a bit of a kind of cobbled surface there. So whether this relates to later uses of the site or kind of parts of the kind of castle complex. Unfortunately, because we were only allowed to dig to where the, uh, the road development was going, i.e. we couldn't just dig, keep digging down, we couldn't actually excavate and un unearth a lot of these uh, structures. Um, so we, we had to just take them as they were on the surface. Um, but this is the, the very substantial wall face that emerged in the uh, far western part of the trench. You can see Rick standing on there. Um, with, it was just absolutely tightly packed with lime mortar, just phenomenally strong lime mortar. And you can see where the digger bucket is there, that's actually where the pipe trench went through in the 1980s. Well, somewhere just along that stretch is where Raven and Land probably, possibly even observed the same wall as they literally crunched through it to put the, the drains in. But really good to see a, a larger area of this open uh, within, this, within this project. And it's probably formed a pretty damn solid foundation for that part of the road. I don't imagine that's going to subside uh, at all. So that's now, that's so you can see that the uh, See the edge of the, you can see where the tarmac changes if you go down the street now. So you're literally just where that tarmac changes, you're literally just on the top of the wall of the old castle. So I think we're interested in commemorating that exact mark in the street at some point uh, as well. So a really quite significant, um, you think of the buildings we have got in terms of Kirkwall's medieval history, the cathedral. We don't have the Earl's Palace because it's underneath that part of the town and the castle obviously. So it's really good to have a glimpse of that even if fleetingly um, during this work, these works. Um, and something that's ongoing now, so we actually managed to get some funding off the THI just before the project's going to be uh, completed because we did some building recording but we felt that it was important to try and carry on doing some building recording within the town. Um, so we've had a series of workshops, we've been linking up with the Historic Environment of Scotland, uh, uh, Scotland's Urban Past team who've been up doing training, uh, training days with us. We've got days where we're out doing recording, so it's a very rapid snapshot survey. And the idea is to update the national record online on Canmore, because if you actually go and you look at the map and you click on the dot, it says 39 you know, Main Street, and you look, and there's no information, and there's no pictures. So we're just trying to do a very rapid survey, and they've got this online portal where you can update that information yourselves and put it in there. So we're, we're doing that at the moment, so if you'd like to get involved, um, there's, there's, we've still got days to, to, to do. 
Um, and there's actually, I've got some dates, which I'm not going to put them all up now. I've got, they're on a bit of paper at the back, you can have a look. I'll put the slide up when I've completely finished and we've had questions. And there's some dates for some upcoming activities. So if you want to get involved, some of these things are still continuing and we hope to continue into the, the future. <clears throat> so just to sum up, so going back to our original questions, how does the sound centre develop during the medieval and post-medieval periods? Well, our project has, has, has answered, has, 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 has found some interesting things that can help, help us explain that. You know, our, our, we found a very substantial structure, which interestingly is not on the kind of north-west alignment, it's not a sea wall, it's orientated east-west. It's part of a pier or a state or you know, kind of a, a hard standing structure that may have extended out to the sea. Um, we've got some interesting deposits around that. We've got these waterlogged deposits which Scott's been talking about, which, okay, they might not give us this neat environmental sequence, but they're giving us some really interesting insights into some of the activities and some of the things that are going on around potentially this kind of um, uh, you know, uh, pier site. We've looked at a whole range of different buildings. We've recorded buildings that are at risk. We've taken photographic records of them through our building recording surveys. We've identified some new sites within the town here. We've identified um, some buried structures through the geophysics. Um, and throughout all of this, we've engaged um, hundreds of people, hundreds of school children, um, and had a kind of uh, you know, quite extensive um, program of um, training volunteers and sharing skills and sharing experiences. Um, and I hope through this you've seen you know, that it was actually a lot of fun, we've really enjoyed it. It would be great to have Kirkwood Garden Dig 2, so maybe we'll, when the dust is settled, we'll try and see if we can organise something like that. But hopefully this project and the opportunity that the Kirkwood THI project has, has given us is, is just to have another look at the town and you know, rekindle that interest in looking at kind of an urban archaeology in, 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 in Orkney. Because unfortunately in Stromness, the Kirkwood THI didn't have an archaeology programme. We did. We've, we've, had a, we've run a fantastic project and we're, we've learned from those projects. We're still developing the things that we do. So look out in the future and hopefully we can carry on doing some more work in Kirkwall in the near future. Thanks very much. <laughs>